Tales of Men and Ghosts by Edith Wharton. Chapter Ten: The Letters, Part Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section Five: The fresh spring sunshine which had so often attended Lizzie Weston on her dusty climb up the hill of Saint Cloud beamed on her some two years later in a scene and a situation of altered import. The horse chestnuts of the Champs Elysees filtered its rays through the symmetrical umbrage enclosing the gravelled space around Doron's restaurant, and Miss West, seated at a table within that privileged circle, presented to the light a hat much better able to sustain its scrutiny than those which had sheltered the brow of Juliet Deering's instructress. Her dress was in keeping with the hat, and both belonged to a situation rich in such possibilities as the act of a leisurely luncheon at Dorans in the opening week of the salon. Her companions of both sexes confirmed and emphasized this impression by an elaborateness of garb and an ease of attitude implying the largest range of selection between the forms of Parisian idleness, and even Andorra Macy, seated opposite, as in the place of co-hostess or companion, reflected in coy graves and mauves the festal note of the occasion. This note reverberated persistently in the ears of a solitary gentleman, straining for glimpses of the group, from a table wedged in the remotest corner of the garden. But to Miss West herself the occurrence did not rise above the usual. For nearly a year she had been acquiring the habit of such situations, and the act of offering a luncheon at Dorrance to her cousins, the Harvey Mearses of Providence, and their friend Mr. Jackson Benn, produced in her no emotion beyond the languid glow which Mr. Ben's presence was beginning to impart to such scenes. "'It's frightful the way you've got used to it,' Andorra Macy had wailed in the first days of her friend's transfigured fortune, when Lizzie West had waked one morning to find herself among the heirs of an old and miserly cousin, whose testamentary dispositions had formed, since her earliest childhood, the subject of pleasantry and conjecture in her own improvident family. Old Hezron Mears had never given any sign of life to the luckless Wests, had perhaps hardly been conscious of including them in the carefully drawn will, which following the old American convention scrupulously divided his hoarded millions among his kin. It was by a mere genealogical accident that Lizzie, falling just within the golden circle, found herself possessed of a pittance sufficient to release her from the prospect of a long grey future in Madame Clopin's pension. The release had seemed wonderful at first, yet she presently found that it had destroyed her former world without giving her a new one. On the ruins of the old pension life bloomed the only flower that had ever sweetened her path and beyond the sense of present ease and the removal of anxiety for the future, her reconstructed existence blossomed with no compensating joys. She had hoped great things from the opportunity to rest, to travel, to look about her, above all, in various artful feminine ways, to be nice to the companions of her less privileged state. But such widenings of scope left her, as it were, but the more conscious of the empty margin of personal life beyond them. It was not till she woke to the leisure of her new days that she had the full sense of what was gone from them. Their very emptiness made her strain to pack them with transient sensations. She was like the possessor of an unfurnished house, with random furniture and bric-a-brac perpetually pouring in on approval. It was in this experimental character that Mr. Jackson Benn had fixed her attention, and the languid effort of her imagination to adjust him to her requirements was seconded by the fond complicity of Andorra and the smiling approval of her cousins. Lizzie did not discourage these demonstrations. She suffered serenely Andorra's allusions to Mr. Ben's infatuation, and Mrs. Mears' casual boast of his business standing. All the better if they could drape his narrow, square-shouldered frame and round, unwinking countenance in the trailing mists of sentiment. Lizzie looked and listened not unhopeful of the miracle. "'I never saw anything like the way these Frenchmen stare. Doesn't it make you nervous, Lizzie?' Mrs. Mears broke out suddenly, ruffling her feather boa about an outraged bosom. Mrs. Mears was still in that stage of development 
when her countrywomen taste to the full the peril of being exposed to the gaze of the licentious Gaul. Lizzie roused herself from the contemplation of Mr. Ben's round baby cheeks and the square blue jaw resting on his perpendicular collar. "'Is someone staring at me?' she asked with a smile. "'Don't turn round, whatever you do. There, just over there, between the rhododendrons, the tall fair man alone at that table. Really, Harvey, I think you ought to speak to the head waiter or something, though I suppose in one of these places they'd only laugh at you,' Mrs. Mears shudderingly concluded. Her husband, as if inclining to this probability, continued the undisturbed dissection of his chicken wing, but Mr. Ben, perhaps aware that his situation demanded a more punctilious attitude, sternly revolved upon the parapet of his high collar in the direction of Mrs. Mears's glance. "'What, that fellow all alone over there? Why, he's not French, he's an American,' he then proclaimed with a perceptible relaxing of the facial muscles. "'Oh!' murmured Mrs. Mears, as perceptibly disappointed, and Mr. Ben continued carelessly. He came over on the steamer with me. He's some kind of an artist, a fellow named Deering. He was staring at me, I guess, wondering whether I was going to remember him. Why, how do you do? How are you? Why, yes, of course, with pleasure. My friends, Mrs. Harvey Mears, Mr. Mears, my friends, Miss Macy and Miss West. I have the pleasure of knowing Miss West, said Vincent Deering, with a smile. Section 6 even through his smile Lizzie had seen in the first moment how changed he was, and the impression of the change deepened to the point of pain, when a few days later, in his reply to his brief note, she accorded him a private hour. That the first sight of his writing, the first answer to his letters, should have come, after three long years, in the shape of this impersonal line, too curt to be called humble yet confessing to a consciousness of the past by the studied avoidance of its language. As she read, her mind flashed back over what she had dreamed his letters would be, over the exquisite answers she had composed above his name. There was nothing exquisite in the conventional lines before her, but dormant nerves began to throb again at the mere touch of the paper he had touched, and she threw the little note into the fire before she dared to reply to it. Now that he was actually before her again, he became, as usual, the one live spot in her consciousness. Once more her tormented, throbbing self sank back passive and numb, but now with all its power of suffering mysteriously transferred to the presence, so known, yet so unknown, at the opposite corner of her hearth. She was still Lizzie West, and he was still Vincent Deering, but the sticks rolled between them, and she saw his face through the fog. It was his face, really, rather than his words, that told her, as she furtively studied it, the tale of failure and slow discouragement which had so blurred its handsome lines. She kept afterward no precise memory of the actual details of his narrative. The pain it evidently cost him to impart it was so much the sharpest fact in her new vision of him. Confusedly, however, she gathered that on reaching America he had found his wife's small property gravely impaired, and that, while lingering on to secure what remained of it, he had contrived to sell a picture or two, and had even known a brief moment of success, during which he received orders and set up a studio. But inexplicably the tide had ebbed, his work remained on his hands, and a tedious illness, with its miserable sequel of debt, soon wiped out his small advantage. There followed a period of eclipse, still more vaguely pictured, during which he was allowed to infer that he had tried his hand at divers means of livelihood, accepting employment from a fashionable house decorator designing wallpapers, illustrating magazine articles, and acting for a time, she dimly understood, as the social tout of a new hotel desirous of advertising its restaurant. These disjointed facts were strung on a slender thread of personal illusions, references to friends who had been kind, jealously she guessed them to be women, and to enemies who had darkly schemed against him. But true to his tradition of correctness, he carefully avoided the mention of names, and left her trembling conjectures to grope dimly through an alien crowded world in which there seemed little room for her small shy presence.' 
As she listened, her private pang was merged in the intolerable sense of his unhappiness. Nothing he had said explained or excused his conduct to her, but he had suffered, he had been lonely, had been humiliated, and she suddenly felt, with a fierce maternal rage, that there was no conceivable justification for any scheme of things in which such facts were possible. She could not have said why. She simply knew that it hurt too much to see him hurt. Gradually it came to her that her unconsciousness of any personal grievance was due to her having so definitely determined her own future. She was glad she had decided, as she now felt she had, to marry Jackson Ben, if only for the sense of detachment it gave her in dealing with the case of Vincent Deering. Her personal safety ensured her the requisite impartiality, and justified her in dwelling as long as she chose on the last lines of a chapter to which her own act had deliberately fixed the close. Any lingering hesitations as to the finality of her decision were dispelled by the imminent need of making it known to Deering, and when her visitor paused in his reminiscences to say with a sigh, "'But many things have happened to you, too,' His words did not so much evoke the sense of her altered fortunes as the image of the protector to whom she was about to entrust them. "'Yes, many things. It's three years,' she answered. Deering sat leaning forward in his sad, exiled elegance, his eyes gently bent on hers, and at his side she saw the solid form of Mr. Jackson Ben, with shoulders preternaturally squared by the cut of his tight black coat, and a tall, shiny collar sustaining his baby cheeks and hard blue chin. Then the vision faded, as Deering began to speak. Three years,' he repeated, musingly, taking up her words. "'I've so often wondered what they brought you.' She lifted her head with a quick blush, and the terrified wish that he should not, at the cost of all his notions of correctness, lapse into the blunder of becoming personal. "'You've wondered?' She smiled back bravely. "'Do you suppose I haven't?' His look dwelt on her. "'Yes, I dare say that was what you thought of me.' She had her answer pat. "'Why, frankly, you know, I didn't think of you.' But the mounting tide of her poor dishonoured memories swept it indignantly away. If it was his correctness to ignore, it could never be hers to disavow. "'Was that what you thought of me?' she heard him repeat in a tone of sad insistence, and at that, with a quick lift of her head, she resolutely answered, "'How could I know what to think? I had no word from you.' If she had expected, and perhaps almost hoped, that this answer would create a difficulty for him, the gaze of quiet fortitude with which he met it proved that she had underestimated his resources. "'No, you had no word. I kept my vow,' he said. "'Your vow?' that you shouldn't have a word, not a syllable. Oh, I kept it through everything." Lizzie's heart was sounding in her ears, the old confused rumour of the sea of life, but through it she desperately tried to distinguish the still small voice of reason. "'What was your vow?' He sat motionless, still holding her with a look so gentle that it almost seemed forgiving. Then abruptly he rose, and crossing the space between them, sat down in a chair at her side. The deliberation of his movement might have implied a forgetfulness of changed conditions, and Lizzie, as if thus viewing it, drew slightly back. But he appeared not to notice her recoil, and his eyes, at last leaving her face, slowly and approvingly made the round of the small, bright drawing-room. "'This is charming. Yes, things have changed for you,' he said. A moment before she had prayed that he might be spared the error of a vain return upon the past. It was as if all her retrospective tenderness, dreading to see him at such a disadvantage, rose up to protect him from it. But his evasiveness exasperated her, and suddenly she felt the inconsistent desire to hold him fast, face to face, with his own words. Before she could reiterate her question, however, he had met her with another. You did think of me, then. Why are you afraid to tell me that you did?" The unexpectedness of the challenge wrung an indignant cry from her. "'Didn't my letters tell you so enough?' "'Ah, your letters!' Keeping her gaze on his in a passion of unrelenting fixity, she could detect in him no confusion, not the least quiver of a sensitive nerve, 
He only gazed back at her more sadly. They went everywhere with me, your letters, he said. Yet you never answered them. At last the accusation trembled to her lips. Yet I never answered them. Did you ever so much as read them, I wonder? All the demons of self-torture were up in her now, and she loosed them on him as if to escape from their rage. Deering hardly seemed to hear her question. He merely shifted his attitude, leaning a little nearer to her, but without attempting by the least gesture to remind her of the privileges which such nearness had once implied. "'There were beautiful, wonderful things in them,' he said, smiling. She felt herself stiffen under his smile. "'You waited three years to tell me so.' He looked at her with grave surprise. "'And do you resent my telling you even now?' His parries were incredible. They left her with a breathless sense of thrusting at emptiness, and a desperate, almost vindictive desire to drive him against the wall and pin him there. No, only I wonder you should take the trouble to tell me, when at the time— And now, with a sudden turn, he gave her the final surprise of meeting her squarely on her own ground. When at the time I didn't? But how could I, at the time? You've not yet told me. He gave her again his look of disarming patience. "'Do I need to? Hasn't my whole wretched story told you?' "'Told me why you never answered my letters?' "'Yes, since I could only answer them in one way, by protesting my love and my longing.' There was a long pause of resigned expectancy on his part, on hers, of a wild, confused reconstruction of her shattered past. "'You mean, then, that you didn't write because—' because I found when I reached America that I was a pauper, that my wife's money was gone, and that what I could earn, I've so little gift that way, was barely enough to keep Julia clothed and educated. It was as if an iron door had been suddenly locked and barred between us. Lizzie felt herself driven back, panting upon the last defences of her incredulity. You might at least have told me, have explained. Do you think I shouldn't have understood? He did not hesitate. You would have understood. It wasn't that. What was it, then? she quavered. It's wonderful you shouldn't see, simply that I couldn't write you that. Anything else, not that. And so you preferred to let me suffer? There was a shade of reproach in his eyes. I suffered, too, he said. It was his first direct appeal to her compassion and for a moment it nearly unsettled the delicate poise of her sympathies, and sent them trembling in the direction of scorn and irony. But even as the impulse rose, it was stayed by another sensation. Once again, as so often in the past, she became aware of a fact which in his absence she always failed to reckon with, the fact of the deep, irreducible difference between his image in her mind and his actual self the mysterious alteration in her judgment produced by the inflections of his voice, the look of his eyes, the whole complex pressure of his personality. She had phrased it once self-reproachfully, by saying to herself that she never could remember him, so completely did the sight of him supersede the counterfeit about which her fancy wove its perpetual wonders. Bright and breathing as that counterfeit was, it became a grey figment of the mind at the touch of his presence and on this occasion the immediate result was to cause her to feel his possible unhappiness with an intensity beside which her private injury paled. "'I suffered horribly,' he repeated, "'and all the more that I couldn't make a sign, couldn't cry out my misery. There was only one escape from it all, to hold my tongue and pray that you might hate me.' The blood rushed to Lizzie's forehead. "'Hate you? You prayed that I might hate you?' He rose from his seat, and, moving closer, lifted her hand gently in his. Yes, because your letters showed me that if you didn't, you'd be unhappier still. Her hand lay motionless, with the warmth of his flowing through it, and her thoughts, too, her poor, fluttering, stormy thoughts, felt themselves suddenly penetrated by the same soft current of communion. And I meant to keep my resolve, he went on, slowly releasing his clasp. I meant to keep it even after the random stream of things swept me back here in your way. But when I saw you the other day, I felt that what had been possible at a distance was impossible now that we were near each other. How was it possible to see you and want you to hate me?' 
He had moved away, but not to resume his seat. He merely paused at a little distance, his hand resting on a chair-back, in the transient attitude that precedes departure. Lizzie's heart contracted. He was going, then, and this was his farewell. He was going, and she could find no word to detain him, but the senseless stammer, I never hated you. He considered her with his faint, grave smile. It's not necessary at any rate that you should do so now. Time and circumstances have made me so harmless. That's exactly why I've dared to venture back. And I wanted to tell you how I rejoice in your good fortune. It's the only obstacle between us that I can't bring myself to wish away. Lizzie sat silent, spellbound as she listened, by the sudden evocation of Mr. Jackson Ben. He stood there again, between herself and Deering, perpendicular and reproachful, but less solid and sharply outlined than before, with a look in his small hard eyes that desperately wailed for re-embodiment. Deering was continuing his farewell speech. You're rich now, you're free, you will marry. She vaguely saw him holding out his hand. It's not true that I'm engaged, she broke out. They were the last words she had meant to utter. They were hardly related to her conscious thoughts, but she felt her whole will suddenly gathered up in the irrepressible impulse to repudiate and fling away from her forever the spectral claim of Mr. Jackson Ben. Section 7 It was the firm conviction of Andorra Macy that every object in the Vincent Deering's charming little house at Neuilly had been expressly designed for the Deering son to play with. The house was full of pretty things, some not obviously applicable to the purpose, but Miss Macy's casuistry was equal to the baby's appetite, and the baby's mother was no match for them in the art of defending her possessions. There were moments, in fact, when Lizzie almost fell in with Andorra's summary division of her works of art into articles safe or unsafe for the baby to lick or resisted it only to the extent of occasionally substituting some less precious or less perishable object for the particular fragility on which her son's desire was fixed. And it was with this intention that on a certain fair spring morning, which wore the added lustre of being the baby's second birthday, she had murmured, with her mouth in his curls, and one hand holding a bit of Chelsea above his dangerous clutch, wouldn't he rather have that beautiful shiny thing over there in Aunt Andorra's hand? The two friends were together in Lizzie's little morning room, the room she had chosen on acquiring the house, because when she sat there she could hear Deering's step as he paced up and down before his easel in the studio she had built for him. His step had been less regularly audible than she had hoped, for after three years of wedded bliss, he had somehow failed to settle down to the great work which was to result from that privileged state. But even when she did not hear him, she knew that he was there, above her head, stretched out on the old divan from Passy, and smoking endless cigarettes while he skimmed the morning papers, and the sense of his nearness had not yet lost its first keen edge of bliss. Lizzie herself, on the day in question, was engaged in a more arduous task than the study of the morning's news. She had never unlearned the habit of orderly activity, and the trait she least understood in her husband's character was his way of letting the loose ends of life hang as they would. She had been disposed at first to ascribe this to the chronic incoherence of his first menage, but now she knew that, though he basked under the rule of her beneficent hand, he would never feel any active impulse to further its work. He liked to see things fall into place about him with a wave of her wand but his enjoyment of her household magic in no way diminished his smiling irresponsibility, and it was with one of its least amiable consequences that his wife and her friend were now dealing. Before them stood two travel-worn trunks, and a distended portmanteau which had shed their contents in heterogeneous heaps over Lizzie's rosy carpet. They represented the hostages left by her husband on his somewhat precipitate departure from a New York boarding-house and indignantly redeemed by her, on her learning, in a curt letter from his landlady, that the latter was not disposed to regard them as an equivalent for the arrears of Deering's board. Lizzie had not been shocked by the discovery that her husband had left America in debt. 
she had too sad an acquaintance with the economic strain to see any humiliation in such accidents but it offended her sense of order that he should not have liquidated his obligation in the three years since their marriage he took her remonstrance with his usual disarming grace and left her to forward the liberating draft though her delicacy had provided him with a bank account which assured his personal independence lizzie had discharged the duty without repugnance since she knew that his delegating it to her was the result of his good-humoured indolence and not of any design on her exchequer deering was not dazzled by money his altered fortunes had tempted him to no excesses he was simply too lazy to draw the cheque as he had been too lazy to remember the debt it cancelled no dear no lizzie lifted the chelsea figure higher can't you find something else for him, Andorra, among that rubbish over there? Where's the beaded bag you had in your hand just now? I don't think it could hurt him to lick that. Miss Macy, bag in hand, rose from her knees, and stumbled through the slew of frayed garments and old studio properties. Before the group of mother and son, she fell into a raptured attitude. Do look at him reach for it, the tyrant! Isn't he just like a young Napoleon? Lizzie laughed and swung her son in the air. Dangle it before him, Andorra. If you let him have it too quickly, he won't care for it. He's just like any man, I think. Andorra slowly lowered the shining bag till the air of the deerings closed his masterful fist upon it. There, my Chelsea's safe, Lizzie smiled, setting her boy on the floor and watching him stagger away with his booty. Andorra stood beside her, watching too. Have you any idea where that bag came from, Lizzie? Mrs. Deering, bent above a pile of discolored shirts, shook an inattentive head. I never saw such wicked washing. There isn't one that's fit to mend. The bag? No, I've not the least idea. Andorra surveyed her dramatically. Doesn't it make you utterly miserable to think that some woman may have made it for him? Lizzie bowed in anxious scrutiny above the shirts, broke into an unruffled laugh. Really, Andorra, really. Six, seven, nine. No, there isn't even a dozen. There isn't a whole dozen of anything. I don't see how men live alone. Andorra broodingly pursued her theme. Do you mean to tell me it doesn't make you jealous to handle these things of his that other women may have given him? Lizzie shook her head again, and straightening herself with a smile, tossed a bundle in her friend's direction. No, it doesn't make me the least bit jealous. Here, count these socks for me like a darling. Andorra moaned. Don't you feel anything at all? As the socks landed in her hollow bosom. But Lizzie, intent upon her task, tranquilly continued to unfold and sort. She felt a great deal as she did so, but her feelings were too deep and delicate for the simplifying process of speech. She only knew that each article she drew from the trunks sent through her the long tremor of Deering's touch. It was part of her wonderful new life that everything belonging to him contained an infinitesimal fraction of himself, a fraction becoming visible in the warmth of her love as certain secret elements become visible in rare intensities of temperature. And in the case of the objects before her, poor shabby witnesses of his days of failure, what they gave out acquired a special poignancy from its contrast to his present cherished state. His shirts were all in round dozens now, and washed as carefully as old lace. As for his socks, she knew the pattern of every pair, and would have liked to see the washerwoman who dared to mislay one, or bring it home with the colours run. And in these homely tokens of his well-being she saw the symbol of what her tenderness had brought him. He was safe in it, encompassed by it, morally and materially, and she defied the embattled powers of malice to reach him through the armour of her love. Such feelings, however, were not communicable, even had one desired to express them. They were no more to be distinguished from the sense of life itself than bees from the lime-blossoms in which they murmur. "'Oh, do look at him, Lizzie. He's found out how to open the bag.' Lizzie lifted her head to smile a moment at her son who sat throned on a heap of studio rubbish, with Andorra before him on adoring knees. She thought vaguely, poor Andorra, and then resumed the discouraged inspection of a buttonless white waistcoat. The next sound she was aware of was a flooded exclamation from her friend. 
"'Why, Lizzie, do you know what he used the bag for, to keep your letters in?' Lizzie looked up more quickly. She was aware that Andorra's pronoun had changed its object, and was now applied to Deering. And it struck her as odd, and slightly disagreeable, that a letter of hers should be found among the rubbish abandoned in her husband's New York lodgings. "'How funny! Give it to me, please.' Give the bag to Aunt Andorra, darling. Here, look inside, and see what else a big boy can find there. Yes, here's another. Why, why? Lizzie rode with a shade of impatience, and crossed the floor to the romping group beside the other trunk. What is it? Give me the letters, please. As she spoke, she suddenly recalled the day when, in Madame Clopin's pension, she had addressed a similar behest to Andorra Macy. Andorra had lifted a look of startled conjecture. Why, this one's never been opened. Do you suppose that awful woman could have kept it from him? Lizzie laughed. Andorra's imaginings were really puerile. What awful woman? His landlady? Don't be such a goose, Andorra. How can it have been kept back from him when we found it here among his things? Yes, but then why was it never opened? Andorra held out the letter, and Lizzie took it. The writing was hers, the envelope bore the passy postmark, and it was unopened. She stood looking at it with a sudden sharp drop of the heart. Why, so were the others, all unopened, Andorra threw out on a rising note. But Lizzie, stooping over, stretched out her hand. Give them to me, please. Oh, Lizzie, Lizzie! Andorra, still on her knees, continued to hold back the packet, her pale face paler with anger and compassion. Lizzie, they're the letters I used to post for you, the letters he never answered. Look! Give them back to me, please. The two women faced each other, Andorra kneeling, Lizzie motionless before her, the letters in her hand. The blood had rushed to her face, humming in her ears, and forcing itself into the veins of her temples like hot lead. Then it ebbed, and she felt cold and weak. It must have been some plot, some conspiracy, Andorra cried, so fired by the ecstasy of invention that for the moment she seemed lost to all but the aesthetic aspect of the case. Lizzie turned away her eyes with an effort, and they rested on the boy who sat at her feet placidly sucking the tassels of the bag. His mother stooped and extracted them from his rosy mouth, which a cry of wrath immediately filled. She lifted him in her arms, and for the first time no current of life ran from his body into hers. He felt heavy and clumsy, like someone else's child, and his screams annoyed her. "'Take him away, please, Andorra.' "'Oh, Lizzie, Lizzie!' Andorra wailed. Lizzie held out the child, and Andorra, struggling to her feet, received him. "'I know just how you feel,' she gasped out, above the baby's head. Lizzie, in some dark hollow of herself, heard the echo of a laugh. Andorra always thought she knew how people felt. "'Tell Martha to take him with her when she fetches Juliet home from school.' "'Yes, yes,' Andorra gloated over her. "'If you'd only give way, my darling!' The baby, howling, dived over Andorra's shoulder for the bag. "'Oh, take him!' his mother ordered. Andorra, from the door, cried out, "'I'll be back at once. Remember, love, you're not alone.' But Lizzie insisted. "'Go with them. I wish you to go with them.' in the tone to which Miss Macy had never learned the answer. The door closed on her outraged back, and Lizzie stood alone. She looked about the disordered room, which offered a dreary image of the havoc of her life. An hour or two ago, everything about her had been so exquisitely ordered, without and within. Her thoughts and emotions had lain outspread before her, like delicate jewels laid away symmetrically in a collector's cabinet. Now they had been tossed down helter-skelter among the rubbish there on the floor, and had themselves turned to rubbish like the rest. Yes, there lay her life at her feet, among all that tarnished trash. She knelt and picked up her letters, ten in all, and examined the flaps of the envelopes. Not one had been opened, not one. As she looked, every word she had written fluttered to life, and every feeling prompting it sent a tremor through her. With vertiginous speed and microscopic vision, she was reliving that whole period of her life, stripping bare again the black ruin over which the drift of three happy years had fallen. 
She laughed at Andorra's notion of conspiracy, of the letters having been kept back. She required no extraneous aid in deciphering the mystery. Her three years' experience of Deering shed on it all the light she needed. And yet a moment before she had believed herself to be perfectly happy. Now it was the worst part of her anguish that it did not really surprise her. She knew so well what must have happened. The letters had reached him when he was busy, occupied with something else, and had been put aside to be read at some future time, a time which never came. Perhaps on his way to America, on the steamer even, he had met someone else, the someone who lurks, veiled and ominous, in the background of every woman's thoughts about her lover. Or perhaps he had been merely forgetful. She had learned from experience that the sensations which she seemed to feel with the most exquisite intensity left no reverberations in his mind, that he did not relive either his pleasures or his pains. She needed no better proof of that than the lightness of his conduct toward his daughter. He seemed to have taken it for granted that Juliet would remain indefinitely with the friends who had received her after her mother's death and it was at Lizzie's suggestion that the little girl was brought home, and that they had established themselves at Neuilly to be near her school. But Juliet, once with them, he became the model of a tender father, and Lizzie wondered that he had not felt the child's absence, since he seemed so affectionately aware of her presence. Lizzie had noted all this in Juliet's case, but had taken for granted that her own was different, that she formed, for Deering, the exception which every woman secretly supposes herself to form in the experience of the man she loves. Certainly she had learned by this time that she could not modify his habits, but she imagined that she had deepened his sensibilities, had furnished him with an ideal, angelic function. And she now saw that the fact of her letters, her unanswered letters, having, on his own assurance, meant so much to him, had been the basis on which this beautiful fabric was reared. There they lay now, the letters, precisely as when they had left her hands. He had not had time to read them, and there had been a moment in her past when that discovery would have been the sharpest pang imaginable to her heart. She had travelled far beyond that point. She could have forgiven him now for having forgotten her, but she could never forgive him for having deceived her. She sat down, and looked again vaguely about the room. Suddenly she heard a step overhead, and her heart contracted. She was afraid he was coming down to her. She sprang up and bolted the door. Then she dropped into the nearest chair, tremulous and exhausted, as if the pushing of the bolt had required an immense muscular effort. A moment later she heard him on the stairs, and her tremor broke into a cold fit of shaking. I loathe you, I loathe you, she cried. She listened apprehensively for his touch on the handle of the door. He would come in, humming a tune, to ask some idle question, and lay a caress on her hair. But no, the door was bolted, she was safe. She continued to listen, and the step passed on. He had not been coming to her then. He must have gone downstairs to fetch something, another newspaper, perhaps. He seemed to read little else and she sometimes wondered when he found the time to store the material that used to serve for their famous literary talks. The wonder shot through her again, barbed with a sneer. At that moment it seemed to her that everything he had ever done and been was a lie. She heard the house door close and started up. Was he going out? It was not his habit to leave the house in the morning. She crossed the room to the window and saw him walking, with a quick decided step, between the budding lilacs to the gate. What could have called him forth at that unwanted hour? It was odd that he should not have told her. The fact that she thought it odd suddenly showed her how closely their lives were interwoven. She had become a habit to him, and he was fond of his habits. But to her it was as if a stranger had opened the gate and gone out. She wondered what he would feel if he knew that she felt that. "'In an hour he will know,' she said to herself with a kind of a fierce exultation, and immediately she began to dramatize the scene. As soon as he came in she meant to call him up to her room and hand him the letters without a word. For a moment she gloated on the picture. Then her imagination recoiled from it. She was humiliated by the thought of humiliating him. She wanted to keep his image intact, 
she would not see him. He had lied to her about her letters, had lied to her when he had found it to his interest to regain her favour. Yes, there was the point to hold fast. He had sought her out when he learned that she was rich. Perhaps he had come back from America on purpose to marry her. No doubt he had come back on purpose. It was incredible that she had not seen this at the time. She turned sick at the thought of her fatuity and of the grossness of his arts. Well, the event proved that they were all he needed. But why had he gone out at such an hour? She was irritated to find herself still preoccupied by his comings and goings. Turning from the window, she sat down again. She wondered what she meant to do next. No, she would not show him the letters. She would simply leave them on his table and go away. She would leave the house with her boy and Andorra. It was a relief to feel a definite plan forming itself in her mind, something that her uprooted thoughts could fasten on. She would go away, of course, and meanwhile, in order not to see him, she would feign a headache and remain in her room till after luncheon. Then she and Andorra would pack a few things, and fly with the child while he was dawdling about upstairs in the studio. When one's house fell, one fled from the ruins. Nothing could be simpler, more inevitable. Her thoughts were checked by the impossibility of picturing what would happen next. Try as she would, she could not see herself and the child away from Deering. But that, of course, was because of her nervous weakness. She had youth, money, energy, all the trumps were on her side. It was much more difficult to imagine what would become of Deering. He was so dependent on her, and they had been so happy together. The fact struck her as illogical and even immoral, and yet she knew he had been happy with her. It never happened like that in novels. Happiness built on a lie always crumbled and buried the presumptuous architect beneath the ruins. According to the laws of every novel she had read, Deering, having deceived her once, would inevitably have gone on deceiving her. Yet she knew he had not gone on deceiving her. She tried again to picture her new life. Her friends, of course, would rally about her. But the prospect left her cold. She did not want them to rally. She wanted only one thing, the life she had been living before she had given her baby the embroidered bag to play with. Oh, why had she given him the bag? She had been so happy. They had all been so happy. Every nerve in her clamoured for her lost happiness, angrily, unreasonably, as the boy had clamoured for his bag. It was horrible to know too much. There was always blood in the foundations. Parents kept things from children, protected them from all the dark secrets of pain and evil. And was any life livable unless it were thus protected? Could any one look in the Medusa's face and live? But why should she leave the house, since it was hers? Here, with her boy and Andorra, she could still make for herself the semblance of a life. It was Deering who would have to go. He would understand that as soon as he saw the letters. She pictured him in the act of going, leaving the house that he had left it just now. She saw the gate closing on him for the last time. Now her vision was acute enough. She saw him as distinctly as if he were in the room. Ah, he would not like returning to the old life of privations and expedients, and yet she knew he would not plead with her. Suddenly a new thought rushed through her mind. What if Andorra had rushed to him with the tale of the discovery of the letters, with the fly you are discovered of romantic fiction? What if he had left her for good? It would not be unlike him, after all. Under his wonderful gentleness he was always evasive and inscrutable. He might have said to himself that he would forestall her action and place himself at once on the defensive. It might be that she had seen him go out of the gate for the last time. She looked about the room again, as if this thought had given it a new aspect. Yes, this alone could explain her husband's going out. It was past twelve o'clock, their usual luncheon hour, and he was scrupulously punctual at meals, and gently reproachful if she kept him waiting. Only some unwanted event could have caused him to leave the house at such an hour and with such marks of haste. Well, perhaps it was better that Andorra should have spoken. She mistrusted her own courage. She almost hoped the deed had been done for her. Yet her next sensation was one of confused resentment. She said to herself, 
Why has Andorra interfered? She felt baffled and angry, as though her prey had escaped her. If Deering had been in the house, she would have gone to him instantly and overwhelmed him with her scorn. But he had gone out, and she did not know where he had gone, and oddly mingled with her anger against him was the latent instinct of vigilance, the solicitude of the woman accustomed to watch over the man she loves. It would be strange never to feel that solicitude again, never to hear him say, with his hand on her hair, "'Why, you foolish child, were you worried? Am I late?' The sense of his touch was so real that she stiffened herself against it, flinging back her head as if to throw off his hand. The mere thought of his caress was hateful, yet she felt it in all her traitorous veins. Yes, she felt it, but with horror and repugnance. It was something she wanted to escape from, and the fact of struggling against it was what made its hold so strong. It was as though her mind were sounding her body to make sure of its allegiance, spying on it for any secret movement of revolt. To escape from the sensation she rose and went again to the window. No one was in sight. But presently the gate began to swing back, and her heart gave a leap. She knew not whether up or down. A moment later the gate opened slowly to admit a perambulator, propelled by the nurse and flanked by Juliet and Andorra. Lizzie's eyes rested on the familiar group, as if she had never seen it before, and she stood motionless instead of flying down to meet the children. Suddenly there was a step on the stairs, and she heard Andorra's agitated knock. She unbolted the door and was strained to her friend's emaciated bosom. "'My darling!' Miss Macy cried. "'Remember, you have your child, and me.' Lizzie loosened herself gently. She looked at Andorra with a feeling of estrangement, which she could not explain. "'Have you spoken to my husband?' she asked, drawing coldly back. "'Spoken to him? No!' Andorra stared at her in genuine wonder. "'Then you haven't met him since he left me?' "'No, my love. Is he out? I haven't met him.' Lizzie sat down with a confused sense of relief, which welled up in her throat and made speech difficult. Suddenly light came to Andorra. "'I understand, dearest. You don't feel able to see him yourself. You want me to go to him for you.' She looked about her, scenting the battle. "'You're right, darling. As soon as he comes in, I'll go to him. The sooner we get it over, the better.' She followed Lizzie, who, without answering her, had turned mechanically back to the window. As they stood there, the gate moved again, and Deering entered the garden. "'There he is now,' Lizzie felt Andorra's fervent clutch upon her arm. "'Where are the letters? I will go down at once. You allow me to speak for you? You trust my woman's heart? Oh, believe me, darling,' Miss Macy panted. "'I shall know just what to say to him.' "'What to say to him?' Lizzie absently repeated. As her husband advanced up the path, she had a sudden trembling vision of their three years together. Those years were her whole life. Everything before them had been colourless and unconscious, like the blind life of the plant before it reaches the surface of the soil. They had not been exactly what she had dreamed, but if they had taken away certain illusions, they had left richer realities in their stead. She understood now that she had gradually adjusted herself to the new image of her husband as he was, as he would always be. He was not the hero of her dream, but he was the man she loved, who had loved her. For she saw now, in this last wide flash of pity and initiation, that as a solid marble may be made out of worthless scraps of mortar, glass, and pebbles, so out of mean mixed substances may be fashioned a love that will bear the stress of life. More urgently she felt the pressure of Miss Macy's hand. I shall hand him the letters without a word. You may rely, love, on my sense of dignity. I know everything you're feeling at this moment. Deering had reached the doorstep. Lizzie continued to watch him in silence till he disappeared under the glazed roof of the porch below the window. Then she turned and looked almost compassionately at her friend. Oh, my poor Andorra, you don't know anything, you don't know anything at all, she said. End of the Letters End of Tales of Men and Ghosts by Edith Wharton